First Samuel chapter 17 is where we are tonight. First Samuel 17. In First Samuel, the 15th chapter, well, we should probably go back further than that. But uh, the children of Israel decided that they wanted a king. And so Saul was chosen by God to be a king. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. And as we see Saul and as we studied Saul and the things that went on, one of the things that, at least to me, became apparent is that Saul seemingly began quite a humble young man. But as time went on, his pride built, his arrogance built. And his arrogance built to such the point that in 1 Samuel the 15th chapter, we know that he brought back, he brought back the king, he brought back the, the, the animals as a sacrifice. He did exactly what God had told him not to do. And God basically had enough with, with Saul. And so in the 16th chapter, he's commissioned by God and he finds he goes to the house of Jesse and he goes through all the sons and he gets to, if you kind of allow me to use this expression to just emphasize the point, he finds the run of the litter. He finds uh, what seemingly is a good-looking young man. He's handsome from the standpoint it says that he has a rudy complexion that uh, he is looking. At, uh, he's just a shepherd boy. It seems unlikely when you look at the brothers and you look at their position and you look at them from the standpoint of, of the oldest, you know, but as God reminded Samuel, God looks different than man looks, or man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And then as we looked at the 16th chapter, one of the things that we noticed right at the end as we closed out our lesson last week, there is a paragraph, the, really the last four or five verses of the chapter, that in many ways is a summary verse. And it, it kind of gets things out of chronological order. It's not to say there's anything wrong with the paragraph. It's kind of like maybe the, the author, as he's writing this, sort of gives us a heads up on what's fixing to happen. Uh, one of the ways of preaching, and I've never liked this, so I've never done this, or uh, once every 10 years or so, and that is that they used to tell you, you know, uh, begin by telling everybody what you're going to preach, then preach it, and then tell them what you've just preached. Well, I like the idea of telling what you just preached because you can kind of put it in capsule form, but I don't want to tell them what I'm about to preach because I don't want you to know where I'm headed until I get there. And then when I get there, I want you to know where I am. And so uh, difference in philosophy, difference in theory. But nevertheless, it probably, when we look at the 17th chapter, and I'm not going to try to fit all this back to the 16th chapter, but if you look at the 17th chapter and you look at part of the 18th chapter and then look a little further on down, you're going to say, well, that, you know, this, how did this happen? Well, just remember, as we said, as we said last week, that that was sort of a, a summary chapter or summary cha uh, paragraph right there that helps us understand. So David, according to the 16th chapter, David is anointed king. But just as God, for whatever reason, had chosen to anoint Saul or have Saul anointed, I guess you should, we should say, as king in a private, quiet way. And then eventually he took his role and position as king. So is David. And as we look tonight, we look at one of those stories that, that is uh, so ingrained in our thoughts and in our thinking because we, we've taught it to our kids. We've heard sermons on it. But I want us to go through, I'm going to add some things as I go just to kind of help make it uh, understandable and, and make it, maybe give it some insight. But then we're going to make application from it as we, we draw it to a close. So let's begin with the, the first verse in, in 1 Samuel 17. The Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. 
and we gathered at Sokohoth, which is about 15 miles south southwest of Bethlehem. So that kind of gives you the region of where you are, which belongs to Judah. They encamp between Sokohoth and Azekah in Ephesus, Dammon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley in between. This was common. This was common. One of the things that's common is is that there was hand-to-hand combat. But also, a lot of the the fighting that went on is that you would have, like, soldiers on one side of, or at least in one distance, and soldiers for the other side and a great distance as well. And they would send out a few folks, you know, a couple of hundred maybe, to, to meet in the middle to fight. So in other words, when you were out, as a part of a, a group, you may not be fighting and fighting every day. Now, sometimes they did. But it appears as if this time you see that uh, the, the Philistines are on one side of the mountain and, and the children of Israel are on the other and they're in a, there's a valley in between. And so there's room to talk. There's amplification of the voice because of the valley. You know, God's natural resources oftentimes provide the best PA systems, if you will. And so they're they're looking at each other, almost as if they're daring each other. And a champion, and, and I want to make mention of this, a champion, this was this was like the guy that would be your fighter, if you will. Uh, we think of our, our a lot of times because when we studied judges, we talked about judges being champions. Well, they a lot of times led, when you go back and look at the book of Judges, they led the armies to fight. But this idea was the champion, the, the main guy, the main fighter. Of course, we know Goliath with regards to the Philistines. But the champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He's a Philistine. Now, some have have said if you read religious books, commentaries and things like that, you may find a discussion amongst some of them that would say he was not a Philistine, but he was a mercenary. It says here that he's from Gath. Gath was one of the five large cities in in the Philistia. And so probably he was a Philistine, as the text says. But his height was about nine feet, six inches tall. Now, I know somebody's going to say impossible. Actually, uh, archaeology has helped us in this. They have found that there was a group of people that were of that size and probably about that time frame. And so Goliath was a huge man. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was... 5,000 shekels of bronze, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 pounds. So he's got to be pretty stout, right? No telling how, how all of it weighed how, or from uh, how much uh, money it cost. But notice that it says all right, he has this coat of mail that is uh, was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, probably around 20 pounds or so. And the spear or the shield bearer went before him. I feel sorry for the shield bearer, don't you? Don't tell him what it weighed. Doesn't tell us. These champions sometimes would have armor bearers. We're going to see one with David in a minute. Armor bearers were just that. They carried their arms of the, the soldier. And so imagine you're the poor armor bearer for Goliath. Goliath's a big man. What if you're not a big man? Some have said that this show of armor that he came out and showed himself in full regalia, if you will, full armor, that a lot of that was for show as much as it was anything else 
to show, you know, and just hopefully maybe strike fear. But nevertheless, you have all of this armor. Verse 8, then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? So there's some verbal jostling going back and forth. Choose a man for yourself. Let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Here's the stakes of the fight. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So he's really challenged them. He's challenged them a lot. When Saul had heard all Israel, or excuse me, and when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Their faith took a back seat to their fear. David was the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem. The Ephrathite is, we're not real sure. We're not, we're not real sure of this statement. Hebrew, as we said, is kind of not precise, especially like Greek. Uh, it was the province in, in, in Judah, in the, the land close to Bethlehem. But also uh, Ephrathite was, was an old name that was used for Bethlehem. And so basically it seems as if the scripture itself is saying David is, is from the land of Judah, maybe even from Bethlehem, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. <laughs> the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of these three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and third, Shammah. When we saw all three of those last week, David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. David's responsibility was to feed, feed take care of the sheep. He was still doing that. But occasionally he would come and he would come to the battle forefront. The Philistines drew near and presented himself, being, of course, this is Goliath, 40 days, morning and evening, two times a day for 40 days, Goliath set forth uh, the appeal, the challenge, if you will, to the children of Israel. Can you imagine every day, 40 days? You're talking about, you, you know, you think about it, you're talking about a month and 10 days uh, when we look at it from that standpoint. And you might say, well, well, why, you know, what's so big about that? Well, think about here you are. You're ready to fight. You you realize or believe that you are, and they are, God's people. And you're going against the enemy here. But here comes this giant of a man. Here he comes out, and he's challenging you individually, but your country, your, your group of soldiers, knowing that if we lose that it, whoever we send out is not going to be as big as he is and not going to be as strong as he is. And if he loses, then we are subservient to the Philistines. And so they're not anxious to get into battle. Well, that's, you know, that can be a good thing. Luke chapter 14 talks about count the cost to see if you have sufficient to finish it. But nevertheless, after 40 days, and there's a trip that's made. It's in many ways, I think, I, I personally think, it's the hand of God. God at this time sends David. Let's look at the story, verse 17. Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. You had to provide your own supplies if you were a soldier in that day. Now, an ephah, somewhere around three-fifths of a bushel, somewhere, give or take, around three-fifths of a bushel. This was a, a parched grain, 
uh, often it, you could take a, a wheat or barley and you would put it in an iron skillet. You know, we talked about foods back a long time ago and we talked about biblical backgrounds on Wednesday night. But they would take it, they would put it in kind of like an iron skillet and they'd parch it and it was considered a delicacy. And so take that, take 10 loaves and go see your brothers, Jesse tells David, his son, and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of their thousands and thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. So go, go to your brothers, carry them this grain, go to their commanding officer, carry these cheeses with them, find out how they're doing, find out what's going on, find out the scoop, bring me the news. Saul, verse 19, and the, again, all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now, they're some 12 miles then from Bethlehem. If, if we are correct about verse 12, if Jesse is somewhere situated somewhere around Bethlehem, if, as we understand where the Philistines and the Israelite armies were, then we know that they were somewhere around the brothers, that is, is somewhere around 12 miles, give or take a little bit, from Jesse and from David and from their house. So from that standpoint, about a half day's journey by foot, as they estimated, uh, they estimated really about 20 miles, 20, 25 miles would be a day's journey. So about half a day's journey. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper. Now that was important. Left the sheep with the keeper. You, you always had to have a keeper. He left the sheep with the keeper. He took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and, sh and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. In other words, that same challenge. He'd been offering it for 40 days. So David heard him, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Now, it's going to take us several verses, but we're going to find four obstacles that really David had to face himself and help the people overcome. First one is right here. It's fear. We're going to talk about these when we kind of wrap all this up here in a few minutes, but I think it best just to kind of read the story and remind us of what went on. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel, that it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. There's a reward. When Saul told children of Israel about this reward, we do not know. But there's a reward that if you can kill Goliath, if you can overtake Goliath, the king's going to give you great riches, you're going to have his daughter for, for your wife, and you're also going to be, you and yours are going to be exempt from taxes. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I want you to catch two things in this verse. You can look at what he says with a note of sarcasm. You might even look at it that way. For he calls Goliath uncircumcised. But, it may not be a slap in the face. It may be more of, he's not God's people. The Philistines weren't, remind, remember. And so he say, you know, he, he's not of God's people, but they're going against the armies of the living God. And notice what he says about God, living God. Think about that. Hold on to that thought. I, I, I do want to address it, but hold on to that thought. The people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come here? 
And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. Eliab makes accusations against David. You can look at these accusations how you will. They're false accusations. Folks can make accusations against you. Folks can say you've said something, you've done something, and it not be so. Or it be taken out of context. Or it's just not correct. Eliab seems to, to be upset, angry. Matter of fact, it says that his anger was aroused. But he's angry with David. Why? Well, maybe because he realizes David's trying to take on something here that he shouldn't. Maybe he's trying to anger his little brother so that he'll run home. Maybe he is truly mad because if David takes action, he's going to show his older brother up because his older brother has been sitting there with all the rest of the folks for 40 days listening to Goliath berate them. We don't know why he grows angry, but he grows angry. He he talks down to David. He basically is disrespectful to David, but he tells David that David's disrespectful. He says, it's your pride and the insolence of your heart. Of course, insolence just means rude or disrespectful. You're acting disrespectful. For you've come here really for only one reason. You see, here's the accusation. You've just come to see something. You've come to see a fight. You've gone to NASCAR to see the, to see a wreck. You've gone to the hockey game to see a fight. You've just come here to see a fight. That's the only reason you came. And the real reason, as we know it, Jesse, their father, had sent David with supplies and also to gather the news. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? In other words, don't we have something going on? Don't we have a battle? Don't we need to fight this? Isn't there a cause, something that we need to stand up for? Then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first was dead. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, your servant will go and fight with his Philistines. Think about what David says. David says, let no man's heart fail. Don't let your courage fail. Don't let your courage stop. Be an individual that will stand up. He says, because of him, your servant will go and fight with his Philistine. David seems to have no fear. And David not only seems to not have any fear, but, but think about that David says, as correctly as he's addressing Saul, but he says, your servant, servant. He understands his place. He understands what's going on. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight for him. You are a youth. And he was a man of war from his youth. So he says, look, I can't let you go. You're, you're a young man. This is a big old tough man. You, you're, still, you're still in your youth, and he has been a fighter, a champion, and he knows all the moves and all the angles and all, has all the strength. I can't do that. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and his uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Think about Think about what David says. He says, look, I, I've a bear and a lion. I've killed them. There's a reason for that. Shepherds protected the sheep. They watched the sheep. But if a, a wild animal, and they were protecting the sheep from a wild animal. 
And if a wild animal were to come in and take the sheep and the shepherd maybe realizes it, but they're a ways away, maybe that lion and or that bear takes it off and takes it a distance, or maybe there's some other wild animal uh, at another time, any other shepherd. The sheep, the shepherd will oftentimes leave all of his sheep and go find that one. You know why? Because if he doesn't bring back at least part of the carcass of the sheep that was carried away, he's charged for that sheep. Now, if he brings it back, the owner says, well, you know, hate it. You should have been more vigilant. You should have been watching more. You should have taken better care of my animals. But okay. But if he brought, so that would be if he brought back part of the carcass. But if he didn't, then it was him, the shepherd, paying the owner for the sheep that was lost. And so it was important to go after him, and David evidently did. And he said, I killed a lion, I killed a bear. Notice, though, also at the very end, once again, that David, verse 36, it says, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. David is convinced, as he should have been, God's not dead, God's not hiding, God's not somewhere else. We have the living God on our side. That's all we need. That's who we need. And so he sees God as able to help him accomplish. And so Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. He hadn't put them. He hadn't put them to use. He hadn't. He had been used to to fighting in armor. He was just a shepherd boy, just what he had on. That's what he had on. Now Saul says, "Look, we're going to send you into battle. We're going. We're going to put armor on you." And so he looks. He he can't do it. Probably also if he is not bound up with a lot of muscles, which he may not have been. He couldn't bear up under the weight of it. He can't. It says he can't walk. With these, for I've not tested them. So David took them off. He took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, probably a Kidron, and put them in a shepherd's bag and in a pouch, which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. When the Philistines looked down, or looked about, excuse me, and saw David, he disdained or belittled him, for he was only a youth. Ruddy, we found that out last week, and good looking. Ruddy could have either red hair or it could have rosy complexion, but good looking. And so the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog? Dogs were different in, in biblical times. Dogs were scavengers. They were not. They hadn't really been domesticated yet. And so he, he's saying, "Am I really insignificant? Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks?" The Philistine cursed David by his gods, and the Philistine said to David, "Come to me, and I will give you flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field." Then David said to the Philistine. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts has the, sort of the, the title of salvation. So he could be saying, I come to you to be saved from the standpoint of the Lord. The Lord is going to save us. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Boy, isn't that encouraging. I'm sure Goliath is laughing. Why? Because he says, you're a youth. You're a young man. You, you, your folks have sent you out. This is contemptuous to me. I, I'm a, a well-seasoned fighting veteran, and you're, you're nothing but a young whippersnapper, and I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. David, though, stands in the name of the Lord. And he says this day, verse 46, the Lord will deliver you to my hand and I'll strike you, take your head from you. And this day I'll give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. Then all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. In other words, we're just going to leave you here. 
We're going to kill you and we're going to leave you here. Not a nice thought, but nevertheless, what David said. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. For me, there's a contrast. For 40 days, they've been listening to Goliath. They're afraid. Fear kept them from acting. David, in his faith, saw Goliath as a target too big to miss. And his brothers and his fellow countrymen saw Goliath as too big a target to hit. So the contrast of fear as opposed to faith and faith that God would bring them through. Why? Because the battle belongs to the Lord. So it was that when the Philistines arose, came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. Now, we you've heard sermons, and I'll not belabor, belabor the point, of shepherds and their ability with slingshots and how accurate they were. And so the text seemingly says David with one one stone hit hit Goliath, knocked him such as that he fell to the ground. Now, it didn't kill him, evidently. Why? Because we're going to see in just a minute how that happened. But there, once again, you go to, to religious books, you see a, a discussion. If Goliath was so armored up, how did David hit him in the head to cause him to fall to the ground? And I was reading today, there has been an archaeological found, finding that showed that the face and the head was not completely covered, plus the fact he might not have had the helmet on, might have had it pushed back a little bit. Who knows? We just know what happened according to the text. So David, verse 50, prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of his sheath. In other words, he drew Goliath's own sword and killed him and cut off his head with it. We, we understand trophies. And we understand trophies of, of war. In biblical times, trophies of war were oftentimes heads. Sometimes it was the armor of the opposing forces. But it would be often brought and, and displayed before the people. And so, as gruesome as it sounds, yes, he cut off his head. I heard of a man once that went to, a, he actually, he was a soldier. Uh, he was in Afghanistan, and he said, uh, You've, if, have you ever seen a, a, a guillotine? And I said, nope. He said, well, I have. He said, I was actually walking up on a group of, of individuals, and he said, when I got close to them, he said, a head rolled and hit me in the foot. In the foot. So you can only imagine the sight. And he explained it to me. I, it was terrible. But anyway, David takes his head as a trophy. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell among, along the road to Sharem, <laughs> even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistines and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Um, this is where, you know, some of the confusion comes in I talked about that was found from the 16th chapter. When, when Saul saw David going out against the Philistines, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. It helps us to understand young man here. We have often portrayed David as like a 12-year-old child. 
but the word that is used here with regards to, notice what he says, young man, was used with regards to a, a young man of marrying age. So, you know, we may have been a little off as far as, you know, 10 or 12 year old little boy, but young. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him, brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistines in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of the servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And we end the chapter. As theater goes, the light fades. I just wanted to read the whole story. I, I just I love that story. I'm sure you do too. Anything, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to point out. I've kind of touched on them already. But is there anything you'd like to to bring out? Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's been, that's, that's the question that's raised in these religious books. Is... 16th chapter with regards to the playing of the lyre, is it out of chronological order and did not happen until after this battle? Thus, he wouldn't have known. That's a possible answer to that. I don't know that that's true either. I think your question is valid, and I just, Scripture doesn't really say. Yes. Could have been. Could have been. Yeah. Could very well have been. And so it's kind of interesting as I was reading the what's called textual criticism with regards to this and the arranging of the text chronologically. My thought was I wonder if verse fifty five uh, through the end of the chapter is not out of place and should have been back in the sixteenth chapter is is my thought. And I don't know the answer to that. I, I think probably Willis in his commentary tries to basically make this statement. He he basically says none of this is in chronological order. And so, you know, the scriptures don't tell us as far as how it fits in. So just understand that these things happen. And I guess probably in my own mind, then I say this. Try to put the picture together as you think. Using the scriptures, don't don't use a lot of conjecture. Just use the scriptures. All these things happen. But yeah, it's a great question. I, I just don't have an answer. Anything else? All right. Well, I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about first of all the fact that we all have a point of weakness. Here's Goliath that we said, you know, strong man, armor, seemingly all covered, and yet David hits him with one shot and all of him, and then, of course, takes his life. We all have, we all have a, an area of weakness. James says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. We have to realize where our weaknesses are, and we have to make sure that we strengthen those weaknesses. I don't know what your weakness is. It could be any number of things. But we all have weaknesses. Also, think about think about the think about the discouragement that David faced. Think about the fact that he he faced the obstacle of of the folks being afraid. He faced the obstacle of being inexperienced. He faced the, the obstacle, verse 33, of being discouraged. His brother tried to discourage him. Saul tried to discourage him. Nothing could discourage him. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Alan Webster wrote a track a few years ago called Facing Goliaths. If you've ever seen it, I've seen it, but I, I looked for mine today, but I couldn't find it. But in the little track, he talks about facing your your problems, your, your difficulties, the things of life that beset us. One of those great things is discouragement. But David had a faith that trusted in God. 
Go read Psalm 18. I had planned on making references to Psalm 18, but go read Psalm 18, and, and it'll help you there that David truly trusted in God. And even though he faced those that tried to discourage him, he kept going on because he really lived a life that that was faithful to God. Yeah, he made mistakes. Yeah, he goofed up. Yeah, he screwed up. Yeah, he did. But he nevertheless, he, he, he lived a life always pointing towards God. And then the, the next thing that, I think of and lesson that I, I get out of this chapter is is that we, we have to live by courage and of course that comes through faith Paul would talk about in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13 watch stand fast in faith quit like men in other words get ready be, be manly we have to live we live in a world that we're always going to be outnumbered Christians are always going to be outnumbered. Our philosophy is different. Our mission is different than the world. And we're always going to be outnumbered. And the Lord told us that. And so what do we do? We have to have the courage that is able to stand. Even in those times that seemingly we're outnumbered and everything's against us. And, you know, right now, you look around, you look in this world, and you say, man, we're, we're, we're facing great obstacles as Christians. Yes, we always have. Children of Israel did. The children of Israel, remember, God says, didn't cho- choose you because you were more in number than any others. He said, matter of fact, you were least. But because I loved you, I chose you. That's the way it is with us. Anything else? Because I know those women back there don't want to go, and they're going to tell me about not getting through Let's bow forward to prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, thankful for the opportunity that we have to study your word. Thankful for this great story. Who has faith but instills faith by the example of his faith. And we ask that we'll have that courage of conviction, that trust in you that will allow us to live our life, to stand boldly before and against the enemies of the, that come against us those of this world. We'll treat them not as enemies. We'll treat them as individuals that we love and want to, want to help show them the way. But we will always be individuals that try to show them what is good and right through our life, the example that we set, through our speech, and through our actions. We ask now that you be with us, watch over us, bless us, and keep us, and hold us as we hold you. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great, great week. Thank y'all.